SpaceX's Dragon trunk has smashed into some Australian farmland and China's massive Long March 5B has broken up over Singapore. Where do we go from here? Hopefully we'll answer that in Monday's Tomorrow Space News. Firstly, however, it's been busy as usual down in South Texas at SpaceX's Starbase facility. We'll start off with the boosters, well, at least the items given booster serial numbers, as B7.1 is incapable of going anywhere under its own steam, at least intentionally. The top cap of the structural test stand, which is affectionately known as the Can Crusher, has now been removed from the tank, signifying that SpaceX have all the data they require from this round of load testing. B7.1 wasn't removed from the bottom half of the stand however as just a couple of days later it was testing once again getting very very frosty. The test campaign did end there however as B7.1 was lifted from the bottom half of the can crusher and placed onto a transport stand. A short while later sitting on an SPMT B7.1 rolled back to the production site where it was taken into the mid bay. Over in High Bay 2, which you probably know as the Mega Bay, the fully stacked Booster 8 has been shuffled over to the middle to be right next to Booster 7. It can no longer hide behind the wall, allowing us to have a good look. This move is most likely to allow space for Booster 9's components to be stacked. Booster 5's controlled destruction has continued and I do hope they aren't planning on reusing the grid fins from this specific vehicle. It appears my hopes have been satisfied. Let's look at Ship 24. It's been testing its forward flaps, waving to everyone driving past below. There hasn't been an aft flap test yet, although they were spread open for the forward flap test. Another batch of Raptor 2s have been delivered from SpaceX's McGregor test site, serial numbers 50, 109, 116 and 120. Some new bridge cranes for Star Factory have also arrived on the back of a truck and they'll be mounted up in the ceiling for moving components. Star Factory itself is coming along quite nicely, with the left side now coming forwards. The other new building on the block, what we think will be a Starlink clean room, has been getting a fresh coat of paint from grey to white. This could be for aesthetic reasons, or it could be a method to try and reflect that soaring Texan summer sun. Just ask Jamie. Florida is also seeing some action as SpaceX's Starship facilities in the Sunshine State are starting to take shape, most recently with a new tower segment being stacked. Not much else can be said except that the new tower has officially surpassed the fixed service structure in height. We know that because lights have been fitted to the top of the segment, warning aircraft of its presence at night. There are many runways surrounding the Cape and a rogue Cessna is the last thing you want. Thanks to NASA Spaceflight's latest Cape Flyover video, which you should totally watch by the way, we can see not only are the chopsticks starting to come together, but also the Cape Canaveral factory. It's super exciting to see an actual building being built for the Starship program in Florida. It really shows that stuff is actually happening. With all of that covered and out of the way, it's time to talk about the two big re-entry stories of the week. The first of which are the chunks of SpaceX's Crew-1 Dragon trunk, which have been found in a paddock in Australia. For those of you who are newer to the spaceflight community, the trunk is the unpressurized cargo section of the Dragon spacecraft. It separates from the capsule before Dragon re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, and it also holds the black solar panels. The observant of you out there will be questioning the timeline here as the Crew-1 capsule returned from the ISS back in May 2021, which is over a year ago, so how come the trunk has returned in July 2022? Due to the phasing burns required for the correct capsule splashdown site and also a bunch of other complicated physics you can do in your own time, the trunk remained in low Earth orbit before re-entering the atmosphere on July 9th. Australia is also really big and Australian farms are extremely large compared to those you may be used to in Europe or the Americas, so every acre of land is not covered every day, leading to a lag time in these kinds of things being discovered. Anyways, here's the moment you've been waiting for. This is what has been found. A giant pointed chunk of carbon sticking out of the ground. This hasn't been confirmed by SpaceX or any official source, but some quick speculation leads to seeing a resemblance in the shape of this object and a trunk fin. Just flip Brad Tucker's footage upside down, stick it next to a picture of a trunk, and I don't think it is that hard to see. Some other patches of debris have been found as well, but nothing to this degree. 
My favourite part of this whole discovery is the incredible detail that we got to see. Even though some scarring was suffered during re-entry, I mean there obviously would be, it gets really hot, the internal composition of the fin is still there and it's really intriguing to see. A normal person like you and me, assuming you're not one of the engineers building this stuff, we'd never be able to get so close to the construction line when this trunk was manufactured. Luckily, this incident hasn't resulted in anyone getting injured, which would have been unlikely anyway, as the population density of Australia is incredibly low. SpaceX also isn't an organisation known for leaving debris everywhere. They like to clean up after themselves. They always deorbit their second stages, and they're the only company at the moment who can send a rocket on its way to orbit, and then land the booster in a state which it can be reused in. I'm not trying to make excuses for SpaceX here. Space debris returning to Earth always has the possibility of ending very badly, but it's not a common occurrence for this particular organisation. China, on the other hand, does have a reputation for dumping spent, toxic stages on populated areas within their own country, and they also don't actively deorbit their spent Long March 5B core stages, which is their heavy lift rocket, which recently lofted the Wentian module of the Tiangong Space Station to the station. Many of us in the community, including myself, were waiting patiently on updates about the core stage on Saturday. Graphics such as this one from the Aerospace Corporation were circulating on Twitter as the predictions of when the stage would re-enter were becoming more precise, from a matter of days to just a few hours, and then just an hour. The final predicted time flying around was 17.08 UTC, plus or minus one hour. The actual re-entry time was only about 20 minutes prior, which is a decent prediction considering no official data was released by China or its aerospace organisations. And then the video started rolling in from Malaysia. Oh my god! The stage was threading the needle between the population centres of Sarawak and Bintulu, meaning that the direction it is travelling relative to some of the videos will change from right to left to left to right. This story is big to us space fans, but it hasn't really been covered in the mainstream media before it re-entered, so all of the people initially posting the footage assumed that it was some kind of meteor shower, which would be a sensible assumption to make if you didn't know that the core stage was due to re-enter over your region. Here, I've tried to show what the route was, the line may be slightly incorrect, but it shows the general idea of which way the core stage was going compared to the land masses below. After these videos started flooding Twitter, the US Space Command confirmed that the Long March 5P core stage did indeed re-enter the Earth's atmosphere at the time the videos were taken, confirming the sightings to be correct. After that tweet, the China manned space program confirmed on Weibo that their stage had indeed re-entered and came back to Earth, splashing into the ocean at 9.1 degrees north, 119 degrees east. This point is very close to the coast of the Philippines, with it ending up not only in the exclusive economic zone of the country, also known as its territorial waters, but also the archipelagic waters of the country too. The coordinates are rounded to the nearest tenth of a degree though, so do keep that in mind. Luckily, this re-entry ended with the debris crashing into the ocean and not a populated area, even if it was close. It is very important to remember, though, that the outcome of this could have been very different if it had. Everyone launching stuff into space needs to be considerate of how they're going to be dispensing of their debris. Controlled deorbits are much safer and predictable than leaving the stage in an uncontrolled orbit, tumbling back to Earth. Instead of tumbling back to Earth, these next launches have left Earth for orbit. Oh, and they were both from China. Firstly, the maiden flight of a brand new rocket, the Jonki 1A. It lifted off at 0412 Coordinated Universal Time on the 27th of July from the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center. It is fully solid, just like ESA's Vega and Vega C, except for those rockets' fourth stages, and it is based off the DF 31 Road Mobile ICBM. The main payload was Sat Tech 01, a new space technology testing satellite, and it was accompanied by five smaller microsatellites. Launch 2 of the week was the third group of Yaogan 35 satellites. It launched at 1328 UTC on July the 29th atop this Long March 2D from the Xichang Satellite Launch Center. The payload was reconnaissance satellites, which means we don't know much about them. All we can gather is that they ended up in a 500km low Earth orbit. 
It's a busy week coming up with the Russian government payload on a Soyuz 2.1V from Pluzetsk and to Padian Adventure on an Electron from Mahia scheduled on Tuesday, Spurs Geo 6 on an Atlas V on Thursday, also on Thursday is the Korean Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter launching on a Falcon 9 and to round out the schedule we have EOS 02 on an SSLV from the Satish Devan Space Center in India. Thank you to all the people on your screen right now for helping to keep the shows of tomorrow on the air for your entertainment. Each difference here represents a different financial contribution and in return for their kindness, the citizens of tomorrow have access to exclusive Discord channels, pre and post show hangouts and space news scripts as they're being written. If you want to join them, head to youtube.com forward slash tmro forward slash join or click the join button below. Jamie is once again busy this week. If you keep an eye on Twitter, you can probably figure out where she's been. So we'll just have space weather. The live show is currently unconfirmed for this Friday. Myself and Dutta are confirmed to be available, but that's only half of us. And then of course, next week, I'll be back talking SpaceX traffic and whatever else is a big story. But for now, thank you for watching this episode. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.